Good morning, everyone. My name is Amy Myers Jaffe. I am the co-chair of the steering committee for the Women in Energy program at the Center for Global Energy Policy at Columbia University. Uh, we're delighted to have you join us today for this special session on uh, ESG in the emerging markets. Uh, the Women in Energy program is a program that extends across multiple universities and also a professional network uh, of women and uh, other supporters. And we uh, look to address institutional barriers um, to the entry uh, uh, in, of women uh, by advancing um, them through enhanced vi visibility, uh, 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 educational programming and professional development, and uh, and also uh, leadership and scholarships uh, in the area of diversity, equity, and inclusion in the energy sectors. So we have a great program today. So I'm going to stop speaking and get us right to our uh, host and panelist, uh, Luisa Palacios uh, will be our moderator today. She is a senior research scholar at the center, um, previously served on the board of directors of CITCO, uh, including as its first ever chairwoman and had a distinguished career uh, in the financial markets, uh, both as a leader and as a analyst. So Louisa, take it away. Thank you, Amy. Thank you so much for the work that you do in the Women and Energy Program uh, here at Columbia. My name is Dr. Luisa Palacios. And as Amy said, I am a senior research scholar here at the Center on Global Energy Policy. Today, we are going to discuss the dual challenges of ESG compliance and energy transition readiness with a distinguished panel of speakers from emerging markets. Um, before we start, I just have to quickly say that this event is being webcast live and the full video will be available online in the coming days. For those of you joining us via Zoom, you can submit a question for the panelists at any time by clicking on the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. We're happy to share that our events are now closed captioned. You can turn the captions on clicking the live transcript button at the bottom of your screen and then selecting show subtitles. All of our distinguished panelists are really highly accomplished professionals that come from different countries in different emerging markets. And that's what's our intention. We wanted a diverse panel of different points of view. They also are uh, companies that they represent or have had experience with companies in different areas of the energy space. Uh, so for example, Clarissa, uh, was at the board of Brazil's national company and sits in the board of hard to abate uh, companies in the EM space. Tatiana, for example, sits at the board of an EM, oil and gas company, and an oil service company. Vashali, for example, is the chief sustainability officer of Renew Power, which is an Indian company in the renewable space. Uh, and Ayan is the uh, CEO of Africa Capital, which brings the perspective of the financing of the energy transition. So I uh, will uh, ask questions to the panelists and I would uh, invite you to, uh, uh, to bring your videos on and if possible, so that we can go through uh, many questions from, from me and from the audience, I will, I will really hope that you can limit your answers to as brief as possible as you can. And I'm gonna start by asking, you know, in the advanced uh, economies and, and companies that are listed in the global markets, the question of ESG, is everywhere, right? Um, how important do you think ESG considerations are for companies in the EM space? And um, if you could, in your answer, also um, talk a little bit about your professional background and how you got into the ESG space as well, uh, because uh, your professional background is also very interesting in answering the question. And for our audience, which has a lot, we have a lot of students uh, and people in mid-careers listening to you. So uh, let me start with Clarissa and then I'll go to Vashali. Please, Clarissa. Thank you, Louisa, and uh, thank you very much for inviting me to be here uh, this morning, at least in Brazil, where I'm based, with uh, such a distinguished uh, uh, set of, of, you know, women leaders in, in their uh, uh, fields. So, so uh, a very brief introduction. Uh, uh, I've been in the field of energy since the very beginning of my career, where I started at the uh, scenario planning of Shell Brazil. But then I had the uh, fantastic experience working for the public sector in Brazil, where my last uh, uh, position was as a head of corporate strategy at Petrobras. And then 
uh, I entered the uh, sustainable development, I would say, corporate arena. Uh, and I've been working with energy and ESG issues over the last uh, 18 years. Uh, I had the benefit of, of uh, serving at an independent external committee for Shell, then board member of Petrobras and CEO of, uh, of the industry oil and gas association here in Brazil. And, and over these, I would say, uh, almost two decades, Luisa, I've, I've been experiencing an increasing, uh, I would say, relevance of the ESG agenda in Brazil and Latin America in general. Of course, driven by, I would say, uh, international pressure, financial markets, uh, the need to sell our products. Brazil is a strong exporter of commodities, as, as you all know, but also by our society and young talent. And when it comes to ESG, of course, uh, looking to the environmental, I would say climate change is a must, uh, driven uh, here in Brazil by the land use and the rapid pace of deforestation. At, and that's why Amazon is at the center stage of our debates here, bringing together nature and biodiversity. When you, we look to the S, of course, we have to uh, consider social inequities, but also racial and gender issues that are really uh, uh, also at the, at the core of our discussion. And then when you consider governance, I would say this is maybe a more mature discussion driven by our uh, uh, markets, our financial markets, but also because governance uh, is seen uh, as very important to enhance our corporate reputation what has been ranked as the most relevant issues when it comes to governance. So list, at least listed companies in Brazil are really looking forward to applying and really fostering the best international practices when it comes to governance because of their impact on reputation. Thank you, Clarissa. Bashali, your experience, you know, Clarissa comes from a more like the old energy, if I can use that word. You actually sit in the uh, uh, in the board, uh, sit as a chief uh, sustainability officer of a renewable company. Does that make the ESG issues easier? You're muted. Yes, thank you. Yes. Uh, first of all, thank you, um, Luisa, for this uh, session and to CJ for. Uh, selecting this topic, I guess it's, it's really important. And uh, let me say, uh, let me start by saying that as an alum of SIPA, I am delighted to be here uh, with all the special co-panelists. So thank you for giving me this opportunity. Um, just a little bit on my background, uh, you know, I spent a couple of decades in finance in New York, London, and then back home in India. And then accidentally, I became a member of the founding team of Renew Power, which is one of the largest independent power producers uh, in India and by asset amongst the top 10 globally. So, you know, over the last decade has been a decade of real action. And, uh, you know, in addition to my role at the board and also, you know, around sustainability, I think it's just been uh, a lot of learning and a lot of uh, understanding of the question you ask. Like, people generally assume that because we're a renewable energy company, we're a clean energy company, why should we even like, should we be so serious about ESG? And the answer to that is absolutely. I think we get sometimes checked out on the ESG front way more than perhaps, uh, you know, some of the other uh, private sector players do. Uh, and I do believe, uh, and with a lot of conviction and everybody at Renew does as well, that it's important for us to lead, take the lead with respect to how we generate clean energy. And so on that front, uh, not only what we do within our own company with respect to following the environment, social governance uh, frameworks, but also with respect to how we can mobilize others, not only in India, but globally. So, uh, you know, one of the, you know, kind of we are signatories to the first movers coalition, which was signed recently at the COP, Everybody, we're the only clean energy company to do that. And, and, and that's basically, um, you know, um, an initiative, uh, initiative to ensure uh, how we decarbonize the supply chain, right? So things which should we be worrying about? Perhaps some may think no, but we think that we should. Uh, now, um, uh, Louisa, based on the kind of uh, your question of uh, ESG and what are the considerations, I think in India, you know, ESG has been gaining a lot of traction and, uh, 
you know, if I look at, um, uh, you know, the launch of some of the funds, they have been ESG centric. If we look at some of the companies which have been signatories to the UN principles for responsible investment, uh, the size of ESG linked assets are growing tremendously. So as we, we expect it over the next decade, uh, this is going to be at about US dollar 250 billion, which is pretty significant. Uh, as we aspire to become a $5 trillion economy, we're going to see a lot of investments from global investors, which we've already started seeing. And ESG we've seen over the last few years, not uh, as Clarissa was mentioning, a couple of decades. That's like a real veteran here in India. For the last five years, it's been pretty good, slowly, 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 and boom, you know? Because let me give an example. When I started looking at ESG and sustainability in my company, Everybody was like, okay, it's nice to do, it's nice to do kind of a thing. And now it's an absolute must do from the board to the CEO to the employees bottom up. So it's really growing in significance. And I think if I could summarize, uh, Louisa, um, and for the panel, governance, of course, remains a cornerstone of sustainability and practices here. Climate change, of course, you know, it is driving everything. It's the big pull or the push, whatever you want to call it. And it's quite ironical that the biggest threat humankind faces is also offering the biggest opportunities for us, right? So we need to grab the opportunities to ensure we can minimize the threat. Um, of course, uh, the ESG journey in India is not a here and now. It's gonna be a multi-journey, a multi-year sort of a journey. And a lot of companies are adopting it. I think regulators are waking up and coming up with regulations. We see that in the US, we see that in India as well. For example, the Securities and Exchange Board of India is now slowly coming up with regulatory uh, requirements, which helps. We saw in CSR, it channelized a lot of money towards social uh, impact engagement by private sector, and this is also helping a great deal. Uh, also, I think ethics and how we do business in, in, in emerging markets and developing economies is always not at the top of the sort of pyramid. And I think ESG is going to really drive that up because, you know, how we do business, how we also look at how we employ people and how we look at biodiversity, how we source, all of that is going to uh, be our, under the radar screen as more and more companies rush towards, you know, kind of committing to a broad standardized ESG framework. So that's going to be a good thing. And energy usage, how companies are using clean energy, it's really helped us, I think, to grow as a company, but I think that's a fantastic initiative. 80% of India is still relying on you know, fossil fuels. We really need to transition that and transition it really fast. And uh, last but not the least, I think the whole UN driven and global driven now SDG sort of uh, frameworks, right? Oh. SDG aligned funds is really getting a lot of us to think about um, you know, what we need to do together as a nation at the national level, at the sub-national level, at the private sector level, at the rural level, level. So that's going to be a huge influencer and driver. And um, yeah, but you know, all of these numbers, which I, you know, I've quoted are usually limited to large cap companies, large organizations, global institutions operating in India. The biggest gap is that MSMEs, which is the medium and small size enterprises are not as engaged. And, I, and they form about 30% of India's GDP. They employ about 400 million plus people and uh, are responsible for about 33% of uh, manufacturing. So we really need to drive and include them to add debt. Over to you, back to you, Lisa. Thank you, Vashali. Thank you for bringing the concept of, uh, of the supply chain of the UN-led ecosystem of regulations into the discussion because these are important drivers, as Clarissa had said, also financing and society. Tatiana, um, what, how are you are thinking about ESG issues in the space where you are, which is a difficult space to be in, in terms of ESG? Yes, thank you, Luisa, and thank you, Amy, and thanks uh, to the Center for organizing this initiative. I think that's a great example of how fast women in energy and in ESG can find common language. And uh, my personal background uh, might seem quite funny because until, uh, until 30, uh, I was a housewife sitting with the kids 
Uh, I started my career later on uh, in academia, uh, writing uh, about oil and gas markets. And uh, I was absolutely convinced that fossil fuels are the best. So it was quite a painful personal transition, to be frank. Uh, while I uh, was working in, uh, in Colombia, in Oxford, in Saudi Arabia, and step by step starting to realize that the world is more complex and that our belief in Russia that oil and gas are like needed forever might be not that true. And looking at the green technologies, looking at the climate issues, which were not by that time discussed uh, widely in Russia, I started to realize that probably uh, it is a bit different. And therefore, uh, the whole ESG paradigm, the whole idea of sustainability, it was also very much a personal philosophical journey for myself. Yeah, when I've realized that EBITDA or earnings per, per share is not the only criteria. And actually, I think for women, it is also much closer to our hearts. That's the way we manage our families, looking at the future of the next generations, not only at the current comfort and success. Uh, that was uh, the idea which I brought uh, to Russia when we've launched our initiative. And uh, that was also the last four years. Uh, it was a battle, to be frank, explaining that the world is changing, trying to convince decision makers and expert community that uh, actually the climate is really changing, decarbonization is really needed, and green technologies are really working. So I can say now I feel like mission completed because uh, just in the end of the last year, Russia has announced net zero target to be achieved before 2060. Of course, there is a lot to be done in the future because now we have to define how exactly to do that, uh, which is not such an easy task. And of course, there is a lot of speculation, a lot of hype about ESG and about energy transitions as it happens everywhere in the world, I believe. But, uh, you know, um, I think, frankly, that ESG issue, it is deep in our roots. It is part of our civilization. That's the way how many communities uh, have been living for ages, for centuries. That was partially lost in 19th, 20th, 20th century with this massive technological uh, progress development. But now I think we are going back to our roots, uh, thinking in a more holistic way. And uh, really, uh, it is not just um, a department to be created in the company, uh, which will produce uh, you know, these fancy uh, sustainability reports. It's about the different way of decision making. It's about the different way of uh, optimization. We are not optimizing one criteria, profit. We are optimizing many different criterions. And it is much more difficult task, for, even from the mathematical point of view. But at the same time, it is providing a completely different corporate culture. Yeah. And again, it's a new paradigm. It's a new way of thinking. And therefore, ESG transformation is so difficult, so painful, and uh, it meets actually a lot of resistance, uh, not only in the public discussions, but much more inside the companies when the people really have to start thinking differently. And here I believe that the role of women will be really crucial because for us, it, 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 I hope it is uh, more close uh, to our way of thinking. Thank you. Thank you, Tatania, for that very philosophical approach to it and very practical because it is a, a different way of, uh, of managing businesses and entails uh, 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 for changing corporate cultures in, in, certain, uh, in certain industries. I am, I am very curious to hear uh, uh, from your point of view because you come at this from the financing angle. So we'd love to hear how you think about these issues. Okay, um, so Luisa, thank you so very much, first of all, for inviting us. Um, so one, I want to start actually by giving a brief overview that I have been financing emerging markets um, for my goodness, 28 years. So I started in 1996 
Um, I do remember when I finished my MBA at MIT Sloan, everybody was going into iBanking and consulting. So I did go to consulting for a couple of years. After that, I was like, I wasn't really happy and I wanted to do emerging markets financing. So at the time I joined IFC, very early crew. Uh, there were very few women there at the time. Um, and uh, I was kind of one of very few early investment officers. I think for Africans, there was only two of us. There's one lady ahead of me and then a few more people joined after that. So my career was all about financing emerging uh, markets. And uh, so I stayed at the IFC for 18 years and then I became MD at CDC for private equity and funds uh, focused only on Africa. Um, and then I took some time off. Uh, women, uh, my parents weren't well. Then I went back into um, uh, working to finance climate in Korea. Um, and actually I wanted to say that in um, my last job at IFC was based in Mumbai, India. So I spent almost four years in India, financing actually at the time, some of the early stage um, uh, interventions in the climate space. Uh, we, were, we conceived a company called Tata Clean Tech at the time. We also uh, backed the first private equity fund focused on climate. And what's funny is that it took them two to three years to find deals at the time. This is 20, 2010, we're talking. Uh, we did the first uh, green mortgages um, where we securitized some of the companies. So it's funny because I have been in this space and I've only spoken emerging markets. So, um, so uh, and then in Korea, we, I was heading the private sector approach to climate uh, for the last four, four years before my current role, which I've held for one year. And I, I'm based in Lagos and uh, I work for, uh, um, uh, I was hired to uh, support the creation of uh, uh, Africa Finance Corporation's first subsidiary. Uh, focused on climate, at AFC Capital Partners. That's I'm a CEO of that, and um, uh, and we just launched the first fund called the Infrastructure Climate Resilient Fund. So a little bit of an overview that uh, for me it's been always EM emerging markets covered most uh, uh, continent, including Eastern Europe and Latin America on the private equity side, but uh, with specific life experiences in Asia and Africa. So that being, uh, how, do, how do I come to the question of financing? Um, I think the second point I wanna bring is the narrative for Africa, which is very important, both from an ESG and in the climate side. So in the ES, first of all, we need to separate environment, social and governance, from the climate change problem that we have that we need to solve. To me, ESG today is, um, it's no longer you have an option to do. You do any company that is operating within a community has to have the proper environment, social and governance in place because you're responsible in the communities you live in. And, um, I mean, last night also I was watching the news about the nitrate uh, uh, explosion. So I'm thinking, what happened there? This is the United States we're talking. So when you talk about our emerging economies, it's easier because there will be a lot of poor people that live in the area. If you are in a company that emits anything to the environment, to the air, to the water, to the uh, sanitation, that means you could kill people or you could damage them, or you can make them ill. So that's a big responsibility. Where there are gaps is on the social. So I have grown up investing using the, a very high standard of uh, environment, social, and governance, the IFC's performance standards. And the gaps that I've seen in India and in Africa is on when you relocate people, what's the price you pay for the land that you've dislocated the people from? Aside from that, to me today, environment should be like you, you, it should be like finance. Financiers shouldn't be financing projects that could harm people. Um, there is a gap between the developed world and the developing countries in terms of what's the price for relocating people. Uh, at least in India, I faced that gap even at the time when uh, you know, you know, we were called like, you want to give people French chateaus when they should have a decent, so there's a gap there. And that's a gap we need to recognize that it needs to be closed. 
as to when you relocate people, have you taken care of them? Have you given them a better place to go to? When it comes to um, the climate issue, which is very important, when we talk about this transition, we have to say, what are we transitioning from? So in the context of Africa, and this is very important, you have a continent that has emitted less than 3% or so to the current stock of emissions. And when you say energy transition, you're not talking energy transition from fossil fuel because the continent is 50% has no power. So, uh, and we're not using fossil fuel for cooking, we're using woods for cooking. So you're transitioning from really cutting trees into not cutting trees. And Africa is also, uh, has the second largest global lung, which is the Congo Basin. So when we're talking about the finance architecture, it, this transition has to be a fair transition, or what we call a just transition. We need to look at what's the narrative, who has polluted the world, and that money needs to come to offset, especially in the context of Africa and many developing countries, to transition justly. We need significant amount of money to conserve both the Amazonia as well as the Niger Basin, because these are the lungs, and there are other lungs in Europe and in the US and other places. So we need to put significant amount of our dollars to do that. But in a context of Africa, Africa is actually suffering from the impacts of climate change. The entire ecosystem, land, agriculture, and even build environment, the infrastructure. So our fund is focused on building resilience to impacts of climate change. And then we, we are also looking at the transition, but I don't call it transition, is how do you give people an alternative, a cheaper way to have the renewable energy? There are issues of affordability. So my uh, answer to the last question, Louisa, is that we need to look at the right models of blended finance to support countries to transition. And for countries that have a significant amount of rich resources, Russia is one of them, many African countries have fossil fuel. So you, you're gonna create a resource trap or, or people talk about in the US asset, uh, what do they say it? Asset, um, um, abandoned assets, I forgot the name. But we're gonna have abandoned resources, countries that have no money, but they have one resource. So we need to look at what's the economic changes to that economy so that they can continue to have a just transition to the goal of 2050, but it's fair, the right financing reaches the neediest places. And I wanna articulate also for more money to build resilience to the impacts of climate change. And you're right, maybe as women, we worry more about the environment. We have children, we have grandchildren that are going to live in this world. We cannot indebt the future generation um, with complications of our current behavior. But I really wanna close and say, we gotta have a just transition and a just financial system that supports the poorest countries to transition in a fair and equitable manner. Thanks, thanks Louisa, and thanks to a very great panel that you've assembled. Thank you. Um and this is, was such a complete uh, uh, answer uh, that you've actually answered all of the questions that I had. So <laughs> thank you so much for that. Uh, uh, and thank you for bringing the Africa uh, discussion into the equation because uh, I am originally from Latin America and that sounds a lot very, very familiar. So I'm gonna go back to uh, Clarissa because um, I think I am putting the table very important discussions about uh, energy reliability, just transition, affordability. And, and I think uh, I, I completely agree with how she looks at that, that ESG is, is one thing and climate change discussions and energy transition discussions are related, but they're not the same. And so could you um, elaborate on how you look at the risks and opportunities of the energy transition and how you look at these issues of uh, affordability, just transition, which are so relevant in our regions? Please, Teresa. Thank you, and, and and again, it's fascinating, you know, to hear from uh, uh, India, Africa, Russian perspective, and and to think about, you know, how, how all these comments really resonate here in Latin America, and and most specifically in Brazil. Uh, and I absolutely agree what with uh, what uh, has been said because climate is such a, a relevant and an impactful 
issue that it tends to, to really dominate the, the debate, uh, at least in the energy field. But having said that, here in Brazil, and, and I would say uh, almost say in Latin America, the energy transition has one point in common with the African and the Indian, uh, uh, I would say, trajectory, but one major difference. The one aspect in common is really that the lenses uh, through which we, we consider uh, energy transition has to take into account uh, uh, alleviating energy poverty and being just in, in, in the sense that uh, you must not leave anyone apart from the energy comfort lifestyle. So this is one aspect of our region and of our country uh, that uh, must be taken into consideration and it's common, I would say, to uh, emerging markets. The one aspect that is very different, at least from a Brazilian standpoint, has to do with uh, our uh, uh, database, our, our base, the base where we are uh, really starting from, because Brazil relies today 47% on, on renewable sources when it comes to the energy mix and 84% when it comes to the power mix. So we already are from an energy mix and at a power mix perspective, where countries wish to be in the 20 years time. So our major challenge, but at the same time, our largest opportunity is how to keep this balance uh, mix of energy sources and at the same time, uh, uh, deploy and develop continuously in an effective and competitive way going forward. So how to develop our oil and gas reserves, because we still have important oil and gas reserves, even though we are already producing more than 3 million barrels of oil per day today. Uh, in a competitive way, we are low cost, we are low carbon, and that's why the Brazilian government and the private sector is investing so much in the oil and gas industry, but at the same time, securing the renewable share, investing in biomass, ethanol, advanced uh, biofuels, but also wind, solar, and the new frontier, offshore wind going to you know, a, a, a whole bunch of opportunities with a, a, a very important share of new permitting being uh, uh, currently under development. No FID yet, but a huge set of opportunity when it comes to what we call the new renewables. Uh, at the same time, we also, and the energy planning is really now having this kind of discussion in Brazil, with the uh, great uh, engagement coming from the private sector, uh, how to incorporate the impact of climate change in our hydropower base, for instance. We faced a hydro crisis, which turned into an energy crisis last year, which had a huge impact on our uh, you know, power prices, uh, both for the industry and for our homes. So how to really reconcile all these aspects? And that's the beauty, I would say, of the energy debate here in Brazil, because it has so many opportunities. Uh, and of course, I would say the challenge is really to remain competitive, but also to keep uh, people including. So to put people at the center stage of our debate, leading with the physical risks uh, that are already impacting and that are related to the deforestation of the Amazon region. Climate change in Brazil has to do with land use. Half of our greenhouse gas emissions come from the way we use land because we are deforesting our forest, but also to agriculture activities. So, so it's a bunch of, you know, combination of cooperation that is needed among different sectors, but at the same time, uh, make sure that our business environment is reliable, predictable, stable in order to attract uh, funds and to attract private investment. In the long, long term, Luisa, I'm sure that Brazil has a lot to contribute to this debate because it is competitive in so many different energy sources. Uh, but this requires that the rule of law is, you know, a must uh, in all our sectors, that we uh, don't allow for illegal forces 
to have more political uh, uh, interference in our regulatory bodies and so forth. So it's a fascinating debate and, and I'm sure that uh, with, uh, we, we, we have a lot to, to, to collaborate with other regions and countries uh, you know, in order to really foster a just transition. Thank you, Clarissa. I think um, how you're looking at compare and contrast uh, with other regions is, is particularly important because we learn from experience of other regions what worked, what did not work. We learn, uh, this is how we develop best practices. And I completely agree with you that, uh, and all of you have mentioned the importance of governance to have particularly you know, strong institutions and rules of the game, which is how ESG, I think, I, I see, is just a proxy for that because it, it elevates uh, best practices in emerging markets. So that rule-based approaches uh, help in the financing as well of uh, energy transition. Vishal, I would love to hear how you think about this debate and how this debate is seen from India. Louisa, that's for the governance part, is it? And uh, the emergence of uh, governance in India? Yes, no, I would love to hear from how you see the risk uh, and opportunities of the energy transition, how you think about just transitions, uh, how you think about energy reliability, uh, uh, and how all of this climate change and climate financing has to take into account this issue, so in particular with emerging markets. Sure, sure, no, thanks, thanks, Luis. And I want to just tell Ian, it's very interesting when you are in these discussions that I was at IFC in 93, and working with Nina Shapiro in her department, I'm sure you were aware of her. I was an intern there while I was at SIPA, actually, interestingly. And then we started Renew in 2010 when you were based in India. And I'm sure we must have come to you begging for an investment, as all entrepreneurs do, and even to many, many investors. So wonderful to, I guess, see that our paths have crossed. And as we look at global opportunities, let's hope that our paths cross again with many of you. So I think if I look at um, India, uh, Louisa, um, there are a lot of uh, opportunities and you know, I think the ship has sailed uh, in, in the right direction with lots of investments coming in, et cetera, and uh, lots of uh, global interest in the country with respect to the opportunity, which as you many of you may have heard in COP26, the prime minister, announced a 500 gigawatt target, which was honestly, we were generating 220 gigawatts just a few years ago. So just look at the ambition. And I think ambition in countries is very critical for us to do better. I think the key challenges in India are just to be crisp. I know we're running short of time, is that investments would have been one, which we saw a few years ago, about a decade ago, that has changed. There has been a huge amount of uh, investments which have been channelized. And uh, let me also just share a fact with you. The FDI inflow into the renewable energy uh, sector so far in 21-22 is more than that was invested in the whole of the previous year. So uh, I think that's good news. So uh, even in the recent budget, we had a union budget yesterday and the government has given a major push to private equity and uh, you know investments also green bonds they're pushing the uh, financing to deepen the financing not only you know in india i hope private sector institutions get involved so there is depth to this financing there's been a lot of innovation we at renew have led some led some of the green uh, masala bonds and so on and so forth they all get very delicious and uh, also very effect, uh, effective as far as funding because you know capital and uh, debt is an important part of funding renewable energy sort of transition which we see happening here. Uh, I think uh, the other very critical problem which we face in India, uh, the second one would be uh, the, uh, the health of the discourse. Right, so we see that um, you know, given the deluge of energy which is going to be flowing through them, we really need to fix it. We need to smarten it, and we need to redo it. And so, there's a huge business opportunity there as well, but a huge challenge if it doesn't get addressed. Uh, opportunity for the government, private sector, for everybody there, global partners, everybody there. So. Uh, amazing coming, you know, very ironical, as I mentioned earlier, lots and lots of opportunities which need to be solved. And um, I think, um, you know, if we address some of these issues, a lot of the battles would be won. But I always mention that as we go through this transition of opportunities 
and employment and shifting employment from a you know black to green we just really have to make sure as the capacity build in our country we do not neglect the majority of the population which is women and that's very easy to happen so i do believe women like us in our respective countries really need to take it upon us to do more there and i do that uh, you know whether it's in the government or whether it's in the private sector or other forums i i try my best so i i'll, I'll just pass it back to you later thank you vashali actually i love that you um, look at the financing aspect as the as an opportunity because we look at risk and opportunities of the energy transition and then financing the energy transition as two different issues the financing of the energy transition is also a huge opportunity uh, and you just laid out how is uh, leading and i think ayana also mentioned how this is uh, leading to uh, very creative ways in which we uh, uh, can deploy capital Tatiana, I will leave uh, the last uh, word on this uh, session to uh, to you be before I pass it on to Amy that is going to ask uh, the questions that we already are getting from our participants. And please uh, continue sending us questions. Uh, we would love to hear from you as well. Um, so Tatiana, we'll leave it to you and then we'll go to questions uh, from, uh, from participants. Okay, I'll try to be very brief. Uh, I mean, I would completely agree with the all the challenges and opportunities of the energy transition, which were mentioned already, but I think it's necessary to add a couple of additional. Uh, first of all, uh, I'm afraid, uh, and it is especially true for the emerging markets, that when we start to copy the templates which are developed by the developed markets, we face tremendous difficulties. They simply do not work. Yeah, that's the problem. So we have to start to define our own energy transition path, depending on our situation, local conditions, geography, climate, uh, social issues, everything. And there is no silver bullet. Uh, it is uh, making our task much more difficult, but also creative. And I think that here, any dogmatism yeah, uh, will be really destructive. So given the time frame and given the emergency that we are facing, we need to act really, really fast. There are lots of nice technologies now on the table, but they are not, most of them are not of the commercial size. Yeah, we need to transform this nice uh, lab equipment into huge assets. Yeah, this hardware has to be built by someone. Yeah, and this is, again, the question of raising finance, not for small installation, but for massive construction, creating the whole ecosystem, all the subcontractors, all the providers uh, who can really help to build all this stuff, uh, educate people who will work with all these uh, technologies, and raise money for to finance all this uh, transition. So uh, I don't know the right answer. I'm afraid there is no right answer. We will uh, learn by doing uh, with it, with all that. Uh, but uh, for me, the key uh, challenge is how to scale those technologies up. Making one demonstrational site doesn't solve the problem making the real transition for the emerging market, which has already lots of troubles, yeah, uh, that is not a really banal task. And uh, I think here cooperation is especially important, uh, global cooperation, while looking at the international geopolitical landscape, I mean, elephant in the room, we all know it doesn't seem to be favorizing uh, this massive cooperation. So I think, again, this is a huge arena where female cooperation networking, yeah, we can support each other in raising these finance in transferring technologies, at least sharing our experience, sharing our mistakes, which is also quite expensive, this experience. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, and another thing that you've mentioned, very important one on the governance. Uh, I really believe that without proper governance, nothing will work. 
if we are not creating on the state level, on the corporate level, proper KPIs, proper rules of the game, a proper, a proper framework, then again, scaling it up, making it like daily routine uh, will not happen. And here, I mean, it will work if it is attractive. So the stimulus uh, subsidies, uh, all the schemes of support, they can work at the first stage when it is just uh, early days of development. But if we are talking about massive uh, investments and massive scaling up, then it has to become commercially attractive. And this is basically the task for the governance to make the rules in such a way that it will work. So I'll stop on that. Thank you. Thank you, Amy. So um, could you please ask the questions? And in this round of answering questions, Ayan, if you could be the first one uh, uh, giving a crack to the questions that Amy is uh, going to pose to the panel. Thank you. Well, great. I, I really uh, appreciate the panel's uh, comments. And Tatiana, your your comment is really you know well well taken. Uh, I'm working on a research project on the role of state enterprise in the energy transition. Um, and one of the things that one sees, uh, though there are a lot of, lot of pivot, um, is that these entities are still spending a lot of their research and development dollars on oil and gas. And then you have to add, and that's, that amount of money is three times what maybe the national government is spending on R&D and clean energy. So, you know, there is a little bit of a misalignment for the priorities you're talking about, which is to prepare um, to prepare those countries for cap capacity and capability to scale. So with that, I have some great questions uh, from our participants. Uh, Josephine Shea asks, um, does the panel feel that ESG ratings sufficiently incorporate the differences between an emerging market that is less developed uh, and, and the application of ESG standards for uh, uh, emerging markets. And she asks whether, um, whether there's fairness in how those weightings come across. She said, for example, in the mining sector, uh, if you're a emerging market company uh, versus uh, a Western company. Ian, you want to crack at that? Yes. Yeah, so, so I think, uh, let me speak about, uh, I mean, the largest long-term financiers in most emerging markets are actually, in the past, they have been more the development finance institutions. At least in Africa, they're still 80%. India less, there's a lot of private capital that goes into India and China and, um, and, and other places. There's also sources of uh, wealth and capital in these markets. But what I can tell you is that, um, um, First of all, you cannot completely eliminate mining. And I wanna get into that specifically because it's the key to the transition, uh, specifically transitional metals. So the reality is because the DFIs have been very strong proponents of ESG in the context of Africa, a lot of these large projects, they will be funded with significantly strong ESG principles, whether they are funded from a public side or whether they are funded from a private side. So there's always an onerous, because we don't have the long-term financing, onerous requirements from the financiers that drive these large projects. Um, and most of these are large projects. If it's a dam, it's financed by the World Bank and others and African, and they gotta have the ESG component. So my view is, um, I actually think, um, the emerging economies, for the most part, uh, all large projects have strong uh, ESG component, unless they are funded by a very one large uh, billionaire who's doing a project, there are those. And, um, and then you don't have a transparency if there has been ESG applied, because we wouldn't know that. Now, I, didn't, I don't have the statistics to say these have X, uh, uh, so unless somebody has self-funded the project, it is very difficult for you to separate because e e EM depends on the global capital market. Even if you look at our institution, we've issued, we always, most of our financing is Euro bonds. They have a strong ESG requirements. Uh, we did issue uh, a bond uh, for Japan, uh, a samurai bond, which has a lot of ESG requirements. Japan is very particular. 
uh, then we uh, we are borrowing from the global capital markets. We did a Korean bond, kimchi bond. We are dependent on the global sphere and the financiers are demanding also very stringent ESG requirement. I would say it's much more onerous for developing countries, specifically unless you are very wealthy and you can do it yourself. So I, I, I would like to answer this in this way. However, we need to look at mining. Africa has actually, and most uh, in Latin America as well, and in Asia, we have the transitional metals. For, for, for us to have these solar panels that are sustainable, all the metals for electrical mobility, for transition, battery for storage, because remember, we keep talking about transition to fossil fuel, but transition to fossil fuel assumes you can get solar 24 hours and so on and so forth. That's not true yet. You need storage. That we haven't solved or is not cheap enough. So you need to have to mine the lithium, the cobalt, the nickel. You need to mine the panels that you're gonna need. And currently actually, the way the world is, no one is giving money for mining, but you, to, you need to do sustainable mining to get the transitional metals that are gonna help us to transition. We need to get more money to do solar and renewable to, to get these mines out. So financing has not been fair, at least in the Africa context, both on renewable or others, but also on key sectors that are gonna support the transition. So I'm gonna stop there, Louisa, if that's okay. Yeah, I, 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 wanna, I, I think uh, that's, uh, th thank you so much, uh, uh, because that's uh, you hit on the uh, sustainable uh, mining. It's, uh, I think it's, uh, it's a very important part of this discussion. Uh, Clarissa, um, yes, uh, given your experience on the mining sector as well, we'd love to hear your thoughts. And Vashali, I would like to hear your thoughts later then on the second part of this discussion the, of the question that Josephine is asking, which is about ESG ratings uh, uh, and uh, how you think about those issues, how you think about reporting. So first, uh, Clarissa, with the mining, following up with Ayan with the mining, and Vashali, if you can uh, uh, answer the first part of the question or give it a crack on on how you look at ESG ratings and their usefulness in, uh, in uh, moving the needle forward. Please, Clarissa. So it's really uh, building up on, on Ian's uh, uh, comments because you know I believe from the corporate world, uh, having to fund our projects with international funds, I think in nowadays is a, a very good lever to really uh, increase and, 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 and really uh, uh, allow for the application of the best international ESG practices. So it's an incentive. You know, you have to look for international funds. And that's one of the reasons why you really have to improve your practices, be transparent and, 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 uh, and uh, report on them. But at the same time, you face the comfort risk. And that's where, you know, uh, we usually, as an emerging uh, economy, face a discount because of our country risk perspective, which has a lot to do with governance as well. But at, uh, uh, I would say, not at the corporate level, but at the governance level. So that's why private sector in emerging markets have a huge opportunities to push for better practices at the government level as well, because otherwise, uh, they can be financially hurt by facing uh, increased uh, 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 country risk. So, so I'm going to stop there. And of course, this applies to mining, to oil, to you know whatever economic activities that you have to fund. Vashali? Yeah, no, I mean, I, I think uh, there is a lot of debate and we can get into it I think, with respect to fairness of where we are in the trajectory, where other countries in the world are in the trajectory, there is a gap. And uh, I think consideration for that is, is helpful. The fact of the matter is that different types of companies in different sectors, whether it's hard to abate, whether it's renewables, etc., are also receiving capital from people around the world who are governed by certain requirements by providers of capital for them. So they need to really follow those rules, whether how that gets differentiated with the receivers is, is not so much of a consideration. We all have to compete for this limited capital which is out there, which is asking for ESG. And I think that's a fantastic thing for the world at large, 
it's going to be tougher for a lot of some of the countries and some of the companies which reside there. But I think we can work together, I think governments, private sector, to ensure that the best practices are followed. So what we do and how is important, but how we are doing it is, I think, super important, just like we do at Columbia. I mean, you know, we all need to get good grades, but how we get those good grades are really important. And so I do believe how we do our businesses has to be of the top standards. I think the huge, huge rush in India for reporting, but that's just the tip of the iceberg. The real story, as Tatiana mentioned in one of her responses, is about the culture change, how we are measuring this, how we're being specific about what we are doing. And, um, you know, if I could say the further just transition to happen, I think what we're doing as large companies is a part of the story, but what's happening in the grassroots is pretty significant. So if we can get more funds flowing in here, I think that is another way to address the justice of it all. And I think that is also something we need to really push for. Back to you, Lisa. Thank you, Bashali. Amy, any other questions from the audience? Let me just uh, use one last question. And then of course we want the opportunity for the panelists to make some closing remarks. Uh, uh, Kashi Deb has a question uh, uh, for, um, for you, Vishali. Uh, uh, how does the ESG strategy, I and mean, we all kind of know, we've been talking about the sort of global pressures coming from the finance community, coming from you know, global standards, um, but uh, they ask, how much of the ESG strategy that large new energy private companies uh, have are locally oriented uh, versus participating in this sort of global dialogue through finance markets? Yeah, no, I mean, I think the, is the question just to uh, reiterate is that uh, are our strategies locally oriented or are they following global sort of defined standards, correct, Amy? Yeah, yeah. So, 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 what, so how do you how do you practice ESG in the local context as opposed to as a participant in the sort of global uh, uh, clean tech world? I think I can say very confidently that the large part of the ESG drive in India, uh, which is being seen, is driven by global investors, predominantly global investors, and then I think a close second would be both public, private, and would be regulators to a certain extent uh, who are now kind of catching up. So, um, you know, what we do in India is, is, is governed by global standards and that's where we see the move. And that's what I'd mentioned that that's the area where we see some traction and it's still a minuscule amount of what we can do with respect to the small enterprises, with respect to uh, also what is being done in India. So yeah, pretty standardized. I think, I think Dev was also asking a question around, you know, the, you know, uh, how much attention should oil and gas or hard to abate, I think broadly speaking, get vis-a-vis -vis the sort of, um, you know, clean and green companies like ours. I want to just say that it's important for this transition to ensure we help some of these hard to abate transition, but let's not take away from the fact that even the new uh, green sort of companies need the capital and the innovation and the support to do a lot more because that's the future. So I, we, I leave it to everybody to interpret, but we need to balance it. We need to help those who need to transition and we need to really give a push uh, to those who are really sort of, I uh, have adopted and are pushing this whole sort of uh, journey forward. Um, so yeah, so I hope I've answered uh, his question, but we follow global standards. Most I see in India following ESG are following global standards and that's the expectation from the investor community as well. Thank you, Vashali. Now um, we're running out of time, so I'm going to give the other three uh, uh, an opportunity to give your final thoughts uh, before I close the, uh, the event. Please, Tatiana, let's start with you. I will be very brief. First of all, that was great discussion. And for me, you know, it gives me this hope that nevertheless, though it might sound naive, I believe that together we can change this world for the better. So looking at these fantastic women who are inspired, who are in their businesses trying to make these changes, I hope that if this movement will expand, we can really reach some results with this soft power. Yeah, so that's my hope. Thank you. Thank you. Tatiana Clarissa. 
Uh, uh, thank you. Thank you, Luisa, for these uh, really uh, uh, very interesting conversation. And I think that the one message that I, that I, I will take from, from it is that uh, uh, energy transition and the ESG agenda has to take into account uh, uh, regional differences. Uh, that we all want to, you know, go forward uh, as women uh, and leaders. It is our role. It is our duty. But we have uh, to take into consideration our differences and to put really uh, people at the center stage of it. Uh, at the same time, be really open to what's happening uh, globally because we are part of uh, the global solution. And without us, without the emerging markets and without women, uh, there's no solution at all. Hey, and thank you. I think Clarissa, Ian, you, your turn. Oh, thank you so much. So first, thank you, Luisa, for I think an excellent uh, panel. And thank you, Amy, for the questions. I think this was well done. Uh, what I wanna just end with is that we are one globe. So whether you're emitting in Africa or in the United States or um, in Timbuktu, it's all the same. We are breathing the same air. We're doing everything the same. We're also depending on the same global capital markets uh, for financing. So um, it really doesn't matter. It's a collective effort uh, for both climate change, but also for ESG. Um, and, um, and I think what we need to look at is that we, at least in Africa, we need significant amount of financing uh, for both to support. It's easier or cheaper to build a new renewable plant than to shut down an old uh, gas plant in another part. So looking at these pricing differences, we would love to see more money flowing into emerging economies um, at an affordable rate and more capital for both resilience and also for mitigating or starting or lighting, because some people don't have lights uh, in a cleaner way. So we don't have to industrialize in the old way. We can do it better, but we do need the right financing and, uh, and all EMs deserve it. And in this case, I'm gonna articulate for Africa. I think Africa has not gotten a significant share of financing uh, for both energy, as well as for uh, uh, becoming more resilient to the impacts of climate change. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ejan. Thank you, Tatiana. Thank you, Clarissa. Thank you, Bashali. Thank you, Amy, for leading the Women on Energy Group here at, uh, at Columbia. Uh, we, I, I thought this was a fantastic discussion. And thank you all participants to, uh, to being uh, with us and, and, uh, and for your questions. If you have any follow-up questions, please write us. Uh, we are really into uh, ESG and women on energy issues and energy transitions here at the center. We would love to hear from you. Um, have a fantastic rest of your week. Bye. And then let me just add oh. this last thing, which is that we have an event February 16 on uh, women in energy, uh, the role of uh, women-led uh, in, entrepreneurs uh, in the new U.S. push for uh, cleaner infrastructure. So uh, join us on uh, February 16th. Uh, you can find the list of events uh, on the uh, CGEP website. Thanks very much. Fantastic. Thanks a lot. All the best. Thank you. Take care. Bye-bye.